Okay, somebody wrote something in the chat. Oh, okay. Thank you, Brianna. Okay, so um, let me double check that I'm recording this. Okay, what I am going to do is I'm gonna record this uh, lecture because there's a remote possibility the one or two people who haven't zoomed in, they could be having trouble with their Wi-Fi. In other classes, a couple students have told me that's happened. So I'm gonna record this conversation, then put it on our webpage. It doesn't negate you needing to come because I think being here face-to-face uh, sort of speak versus a recording will be a little more palatable. Plus I am taking role. Um, so I will um, put this recording on the web page a little bit later. I'm sorry that we're having to resort to this, but I'm glad that we can because we can't really afford to miss two more days of class. On Thursday, I plan to Zoom as well. It is possible that the university will have classes on Thursday, that the university will be opened up because I think the snow is past. I don't think it's supposed to snow anymore, although I haven't checked the forecast to be sure. But I kind of live out in the country or country-esque and I don't think I'll be able to get in Thursday. So let's just plan to Zoom like this again and on Thursday we will talk about chapters five and six. Today we'll finish three and four and we'll be able to talk about five and six on Thursday. Um, also, don't forget that you have a forum that is due Friday. So since you're snowed in, some of you have already done it, but if you're traveling or you have any other plans, make sure you get your forum you know, in before the end of the week. It's due at 11.55 Friday. And so it's kind of weird because I, I can't see you all, but I'll just keep talking as if you're there. I see your names and I'm assuming you're listening. It's just awkward, isn't it? Um, so I just wanna, before I start talking about chapter three, uh, does anybody have any questions about anything on the Canvas page? Anything, just keep up with the reading and keep up with the assignments. Because of Canvas and you turn everything in electronically, the snow does not affect deadlines. Um, does anybody have any questions about anything due though? Okay, I'll take that as a no. You can always uh, put some questions in the chat or as we move along, if you get questions, um, you can um, ask them. Um, can I ask real quick about the forum? Yes. Um, so like you said, it was due Friday, but I just looked at it and the postings were supposed to do, be due yesterday. Is it okay if we still go ahead and post in there? Yeah, you know, I think we're all off just a little bit. So go ahead and post in there. I won't take off points for that. I forgot to remind you, which, you know, on one level, it's not my responsibility to remind you. On another level, yeah. I try to. Yeah. So um, yeah, go ahead. And the main reason I try to have you post early is so then you can respond to others. But yeah, just go ahead. If you haven't, just go ahead and post normally. And then hopefully, um, from what I looked at, it looked like some people have, so then you'll be able to do your responses to classmates. So yeah, just ignore that um, for this time and, and I won't take off any points for it. Thank okay. you for asking thank that because you. you're not the only one probably who wondered. Yeah, so, okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, don't let that stop you. Um, just go ahead and post. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Okay, that's a really good question. I also, this morning, this is an upcoming forum, not the one due this week, forum three. I noticed it had a September date. So when I moved it over from Canvas, it had a wrong date. That's not due till February 28th, but I have fixed that. So that's the one after this one. And so that's been fixed. And I guess when I converted or rolled it over from Moodle, I didn't fix that one. But so if you see that pop on your calendar, that's because I fixed it this morning. Okay, on whenever we met last, <laughs> we talked about chapter three and we got started. So we got all the way to um, the military. Yes, we got to military legitimization. 
Um, and that's where we stopped. Um, one of the things that you'll discover in your textbook as you're looking at the industrial age is that um, the US military um, wanted its soldiers to be fit and sports seemed to be a way to do that. As a matter of fact, it's a fun way to do that. And so uh, the military began to use sports as a way to keep the troops fit. Um, and so physical fitness was seen as an advantage in the military. Oops, I just barely touched that. And an advantage, you know, physically to physically fit soldiers. Um, and so they promoted athleticism in general. And then in 1919, they had some inter-allied games um, between allies and with soldiers. And so um, sports eventually becomes a part of almost every aspect and culture of American society. The golden age of sports is really a fun period and it reflects the cultural values in sport just like it does today. Um, but it, it becomes something that's assimilated in society that um, as industrialization hits and as American culture uh, becomes more modernized and technology, people have shorter work weeks, people have more and more leisure time. And one of the things that happens too is that Sunday was kind of seen as a time that was for church and they had um, blue Sunday laws where you couldn't have organizations open on Sunday. And as um, just slowly and surely those kind of things kind of fade away and so Games were originally kind of foreboding on Sunday, but then they became part of Sunday leisure. So in a sense, not that church doesn't matter today, I, I didn't look it up, but there's millions of people who go to church or synagogue or, or different forms of worship on Saturday and Sunday, depending upon your religion. In some respects, sports kind of becomes a different kind of religion. And I, if you're a person of faith, I don't mean that sacrilegiously, but you know, it is something that we almost worship as a nation, not that we should, I'm not suggesting that, but sports kind of moves on to Sunday as um, the blue Sunday laws kind of go away and we see sports become more and more a part of our modern society. Um, it helps us when we end our two great world wars to have something to participate in as a society and we become also tremendous spectators of the sport. Again, it gives us something to do on our leisure time. During this period, coaches like uh, a variety of different coaches, um, you know, Vince Lombardi type folks or athletes like Babe Ruth and uh, Ty Cobb, sports writers like Grantland Rice, they become huge icons in society sort of like today, Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes. Um, I don't know if a lot of the sports writers are quite as iconic, although they certainly are big national figures. Um, your book talks about how Grantland Rice was kind of the big iconic guy until Howard Cosell comes along in television in terms of impact on a sport. Um, but the golden age of sports kind of creates a sense of community, and uh, it's supported by the military, which uh, is something the nation also supports. And so it's just kind of this hyperbolic period of an overinflation, really, of what sports should mean. Um, but I'm just as guilty today of that because I, I love sports. But the golden age of sports, we see these great icons created. In terms of sports reporting, um, there's a special kind of writing. Like if you've ever written anything, or not, if you ever read anything by Grantland Rice, which you can find his stuff on, online if you want to Google him, there's a great prose to his writing. Um, he, he got his degree from Vanderbilt University in, I think, Latin and Greek. And so he's, he's really this well um, studied, I guess you would say, a writer who, uh, it, he's almost more of a writer we think of in English than we do in kind of sports reporting or journalism. And there's a lot of use of metaphors and analogies and things like that. 
um, where they're trying to grip the reader emotionally and make them become, you know, part of the culture. Um, there's also this attempt in the leads to stories, which is the end of the stories, to kind of grab you and it's real emotional, sometimes light on facts. So the golden age of sports kind of creates this, these great mythical people like Babe Ruth. Um, not that Babe Ruth wasn't the home run king, I'm not saying that, but they kind of almost like Wyatt Earp-like or Billy the Kid-like in the West, they make the legends almost bigger than the man. Um, and so there's a lot of storytelling, that kind of stuff. And that's a lot of what characterizes the golden age of sports. They also use a lot of nicknames, um, which we still see today. So moving from the golden era, that's what's called the perspective period of sports. And that's where there's sort of a, a changing look at what sports writers do. Um, in the golden period, they weren't objective. They weren't supposed to be. They didn't try to be. Um, but in the perspective period, some questions are asked about, should there be objectivity in sports report, reporting? And um, should there be you know, some kind of line where if you're reporting on a team that you need to be objective, that you shouldn't be a cheerleader? Um, and so that begins kind of a period of relooking at sports communication. The Great Depression hits. Um, the stock market has a crash in 1929, and during the 30s, we have a Great Depression. And so there's a tremendous economic impact. Um, and so it, if it hits the world of sports. And um, so sports feels it, but in some ways, just kind of like the movie industry, sports and the movies also gave people who, during the Depression, something to do and something to think about. Uh, movie ticket sales goes down, goes down a little bit in the depression, but it's not as much as you think because you could go pay a little bit to go to a movie and you could escape your woes. And sports did a little bit of that, but there was an economic impact. Um, there's also, uh, after the depression, during this period, there's sort of a reorganization of newspaper culture. Part of that comes about because of 1920s, we have the explosion of radio and radio kind of changes the game. And so newspaper had to kind of recreate itself in the light of this new medium. And so one of the things it attempts to do is to create a little more independence and autonomy from the sports organizations. And um, it also expanded coverage during this period to include more on college sports and more on football and basketball. Um, and so during this perspective period, we see these kinds of major trends. Any questions before I move on? Okay, so we already kind of talked about the development of radio and one of the ways that changed uh, newspaper coverage of sports is that you could literally have play-by-play -play going on during the game. And so there was an immediacy in the coverage and there was realism because you would have the play-by-play -play guys saying, and back then it was mostly guys, not that there aren't play-by-play -play women today, but during this period, it was mostly um, men. Um, they would be telling what was going on. And so uh, they were trying to cover the game more than make the game bigger than life. So it kind of changed the nature of coverage. Um, if you remember back to last time we were together, we did play a video about the social nature of sports and how sports can change things in society. And um, we see that through some of these things here on the slide. The 1936 Olympic Games was a really big one because in 1936, um, Nazis had risen to power in Germany. The Olympic Games were going to be in Berlin. And the Nazi party, um, leaders of the Nazi party expressed um, tremendously racist perspectives. And so there were a lot of conversations about boycotting the Olympics because of that. Um, and then you have uh, people like Jesse Owens 
who from um, America, who was a tremendous athlete, he participated in one and he showed a lot of courage in doing that. So there was a lot of that kind of thing going on in that particular Olympic games. Um, so you could see sports as kind of a international political thing, particularly through the Olympic games and things like that. Um, it was a part of the Cold War, a part of different countries um, kind of competing with each other. Uh, you guys are a little young for this, but you may have seen the movie that was uh, produced by Disney called Miracle. And that movie was about the 1980 American uh, hockey team beating the Russian team. They were the superior team. Um, there was no question that they were, but we, um, in a special moment in time, we defeated them and won the gold medal. And there was, that was seen as kind of a, our domination over them in the Cold War when it was really just a sporting event. But to the Russians and to the Americans, it meant more. Um, if you haven't seen that movie, I recommend it. It is a great movie. It is, I think, relatively historically accurate. It stars Kurt Russell as the coach. And uh, really recommend that sometime on Netflix if you haven't seen it. Also during the perspective period, we have a form of alternative press that begins to become more and more powerful. And we have African-American newspapers that um, are advocating for the elimination of, into, um, the elimination of segregation in sports. Uh, they very much championed, for example, Jackie Robinson becoming part of Major League Baseball. And the American communist press was also an um, alternate press. And even though the African-American newspapers and the communist newspapers had very different perspectives and very different purposes. They both called for equality and they both really pushed for Jackie Robinson. So that's some of the uh, trends we see in the perspective period. So in the transition years, um, we see there's a, a real increase in sports coverage by major network uh, network television. We see women come into the field. It still was very, very slow, but because of Title IX, um, women got equality in sports, and therefore eventually women got equality as reporters. Um, this really impacted my life, Title IX. Um, it was approved when I was a kid, and uh, I believe it was approved when I was about nine years old. And when I was a kid, I had two older brothers and I would follow them to their baseball games and there was no softball for me. Uh, matter of fact, I was pretty good at sports and one of the boys teams tried to get me to play with them and my parents wouldn't let me. They felt I'd get hurt. Well, Title IX is passed and next thing you know, we have softball teams. And so I was able to play most of my childhood and up until my adulthood in softball. And um, those of you who play on sports teams now, you know that that really gives you a certain level of confidence and different things. So Title IX, my life would have been very different had it not been passed when it was. Um, and so hopefully it's benefited you guys too in ways you may not even know because sports have always been there for you. Um, but women have entered the field of sports coverage um, I was encouraged uh, by the most recent Super Bowl, even though my team lost and it took me at least two days to get over the, the defeat of the Chiefs. <laughs> Actually, I'm not entirely over it now, but they had the first female official on the field who um, officiated a Super Bowl game. And the Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, when they won, they had two female coaches on their coaching staff. So two women in the first time in the NFL history won Super Bowl rings. Um, I don't remember their exact positions, but I think one of them dealt with um, like training and I, I don't remember, but there were two female coaches on the Tampa Bay Bucks coaching staff. So there has been progress made. Uh, in 1954, Henry Luce uh, decided to launch Sports Illustrated. 
Henry Luce was this magazine mogul. He was the publisher of Time and Life magazine. And um, he was one of the most influential publishers of the 20th century. And he realizes that sports is becoming a deal and that people wanted something that would kind of summarize sports. And so he decided to uh, publish a magazine called Sports Illustrated. And it basically was the time in life of sports. A lot of people thought it was a crazy idea. He was ahead of his time, but fans loved it. And he, it was very successful. It still exists today. And it helped to bring about um, fandom from within the middle class, people who read the magazine. And so Sports Illustrated is really an important tie into the acceptance of sports by the American public and sort of the increasing fandom, if you will. Before we get into TV, does anybody have a question about any of that? Okay, anything in the chat room? I don't think so. Nothing in the chat. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and talk about TV then, because this is kind of our era. T TV in the digital era is, is ours, although the early beginning of it, again, when they're talking about Pete Rozelle and Rune Arledge, I was a kid, so I know you guys weren't around, but I remember these things because my, my dad and my brothers and I were huge, huge sports fans. So uh, Pete Rozelle and Rune Arledge were TV pioneers who helped make sports on television what it is today. Without them, would we have sports on television? Yes, but they were early pioneers and innovators who made a huge difference. Um, they took technological inventions, inventions and advancements and made it huge. Um, they understood sports marketing and they were responsible for the launch of Monday Night Football. Um, Monday Night Football, when it first launched, had Howard Cosell and I believe, uh, oh, I can't say their names right now, I believe Don Meredith and then eventually uh, Frank Gifford, but there was somebody before Frank, I'm just forgetting who. And they kind of brought football into our living rooms on Monday night. And that was a big deal in the 70s. Um, and now, you know, we have it not only on Monday night, but we have Thursday night football and Sunday night football. Pete Rozelle was the commissioner of the NFL um, back in these days. And one of the things he did was the football league, uh, the coaches and the teams and the owners kind of had this mentality, I am for my team and what's best for me. And Roselle came in and said, if you start thinking about the league as a whole, we can market the league as a whole and that will benefit the individual teams. And so instead of having teams trying to get coverage, the NFL as a group bid for broadcast rights and it really helped build cohesion and the NFL right now in terms of marketing and its its presence on television it's hard to imagine that it it could be more present I mean it's on Sunday it's on Monday night it's on Thursday night and this past year uh, because of COVID it was sometimes on other days of the week uh, when you get close to the playoffs it's on Saturday to get the playoffs in and so, but it was Pete Rozelle, the former NFL commissioner, who came up with the idea of thinking like a league and getting television to bid for the league's business. He also was the person who brought us the Super Bowl. The NFL and the American Football League were separate. And he decided that if we brought them together and had a Super Bowl um, between the two, it used to be the NFL would have its you know, league winner or the American Football League would have its league winner. But if they took those and brought it together, you could have a spectacular mythic event, which is exactly what the Super Bowl has become. Um, and it has elevated the status of Super Bowl in culture and society. And um, it has um, helped advertising and marketing. And Pete Rozelle is largely responsible for that. It's not that the NFL hasn't continued, but um, you know, we've had 
what, this was Super Bowl 55, I think. And so because of Pete Rozelle, we've had these past 55 Super Bowls and we'll continue to have them. Rune Arledge was a TV mastermind who was in charge of ABC News. Um, and they did a lot of different things. And Rune Arledge kind of pioneered different innovative things related to sports, things like instant replay. I can't even imagine watching a game today without instant replay where you can go back and see a particular play. Sometimes in real time, it's hard to see everything. And they, he uh, helped to pioneer slow motion, handheld cameras, split screens, and end zone cameras, and a lot of different things we enjoy today, he created. He also created the wild world of sports in 1961. I was born in 62, so I don't remember uh, the first coverage, but when I was a kid in the 70s, I definitely watched Why World of Sports all the time. And one of the big things it did, which is um, you can see in the title, is it was the wild world of sports. So it featured international things, particularly the Olympics. If you cared about Olympic coverage, you watched the Wild World of Sports and ABC News. So Olympics becomes a major television event in large part because of Rune Arledge and ABC. You know, it's, it's now no longer just associated with ABC, but in the beginning it was because he had this tremendous vision of creating the Olympic Games into something spectacular. Okay, I just need a minute because I'm talking a mile a minute. Okay, so we're kind of fast forwarding there from the 70s, 60s, 70s into uh, digital sports communication, which is the era that we're in and the era that you will work in. Um, so contemporary sport communication uh, becomes more and more segmented with cable TV and ESPN. Um, and so ESPN uh, was ranked in the top 50 of the world's most popular brands about two years ago. It has a huge global outreach and uses multiple platforms. Um, I think that's why we're really fortunate here at SEMO to have a relationship with ESPN Plus because um, the work that we do with them gives you guys um, just a tremendous platform. Putting on your resume that you help produce programs for ESPN Plus um, probably will help make you look very marketable. Plus, actually doing the work gives you the skills you need. Um, so with enhanced technology came enhanced communication strategies. And so now uh, they think sports fans spend about eight hours a week on various forms of sport media. Um, I don't know, you know for sure how they know that. I'm sure they've surveyed it. They've got different ways to measure that. But I will say, just before you guys came on, I had my computer audio muted and I was watching SportsCenter because I was, they're talking about uh, Dak Prescott and whether or not the Cowboys are gonna extend his contract. So I know I watch probably two hours a day, so that's 14 hours a week. So, um, and there's a lot of different multimedia strategies and that kind of things um, with social media. In the digital age, uh, these other things that we've talked about are continuing. Um, we have sports pages in newspapers. We still have Sports Illustrated. We have the Olympic game coverage, all of these different things. But we also now have Twitter and Instagram and all sorts of sports media. Um, and so there's um, journalists who are working in sports across multiple platforms. Um, there's a change in the journalist source relationship, uh, the role of media outlets, and the use of mobile applications. Um, athletes themselves promote their brand through social media. A couple days ago, maybe just yesterday, I don't know, the snow has kind of uh, warped my sense of time a little bit, but Tom Brady um, put on Twitter a picture of him with his um, trainer going, uh, going back to work looking for ring eight or something like that. And they all went crazy about how hard he works and all of that. That's Tom Brady branding himself. It's not that he doesn't work hard, 
but you could just, you know, go work and not tell people, but you know, branding yourself is really smart in the digital age and more and more athletes are good at it. Um, if you're not good at it, it can really also be detrimental, but there's a lot of expansion of sports coverage in the digital age. This video about sport and social issues, we watched that in class, so we're not gonna watch it now. And then here's some different review questions that you can ask yourself if you want to. I'm not gonna take time here to ask them. And these are some individual exercises that if we weren't in the period of COVID, sometimes they're kind of fun to break up into groups when we're in classroom and do them, but um, we are in the time of COVID, so I'm gonna just pass over them. And so, uh, now we're not quitting. We've got about 45 minutes. And what I'd like to do is uh, talk about chapter four. Um, and, but I, any questions before I pull up the chapter four PowerPoint over the history or anything like that? Okay. Well, that sounds good. Let me pull up uh, PowerPoint chapter four. And I'm assuming everybody can see that. Can someone just chime in and let me know you can I've, that you can see the shared slides? Okay, thank you. Somebody gave me a thumbs up. Okay, one of the things I like about this book, I think this is uh, one of the best books on the market for this class, is that there's a lot of information in the chapters, but they're not hugely long. And so I do think we'll be able to finish this chapter today. And um, on Thursday, we'll be able to talk about chapter five and six. So make sure you've read through chapter six by Thursday. So chapter four talks about how to define sports communication itself, and then the strategic sport communication, um, basically method. Um, and so that's what we're gonna talk about here. So hopefully when you leave this class, you should be able to define what sport communication is and how it has developed. We just talked a lot about how it's developed in the last 45 minutes. Um, and so we also have various elements, processes, theoretical frameworks, components of what is involved in sports communication. So first and foremost, sports communication is a form of communication, has some of the same elements, but then sport adds different context to it. So um, one of the things that you'll need to know for the exam and for some of the other things is strategic sport communication model. And so we're gonna talk about that. This chapter talks about that. And again, it's very similar to the most basic communication model there is. The most basic communication model is there's a sender, there's a receiver, there's a message in a channel. You need four components. So a sender sends a message over a channel to a receiver. That's the most basic form. In sports, there's a couple more components added to it. A couple of the things that you're supposed to take away from this chapter is the different segments and aspects of personal and organizational sport communication. So um, how does an organization communicate? Um, many of you want to be athletic directors. You want to be um, people within an organization, sports organization that communicates. And so you need to understand sort of how an organization itself communicates. Um, and then want you to understand the difference, um, the relationship between the model and integrated marketing communications and public relations and that kind of thing. So I like these profiles that the chapters open up with. I hope you're reading them and you enjoy them too. Greg Norman um, is a very um, aggressive golfer in terms of how he brands himself. And so he's one of the guys early on who um, 
works really, really hard at not just winning golf tournaments, although he's a little bit older now, but, um, but in making sure that he has a real brand. And so uh, he engaged in sports communication throughout his entire career and sort of made Greg Norman a particular brand and is keeping with sports reporting and other things. Um, a sports reporter gave him the nickname, the shark. Um, and so the shark is a nickname that has more to do with his aggressive nature in communicating than it does necessarily the, his aggressive nature on the golf course. Um, but he really does try to attack life and that's his nickname. Um, in this particular profile, the book uh, makes a distinction between intra organization, intra communication and inter organizational communication. The first one, intra, is when you communicate with yourself. Okay, and we all do it. It may sound weird, but we all talk to ourselves, even if it's not verbal. You know, I talk to my, the older I get, the more I talk to myself out loud. But you may not do it that way, but you still, in your mind, talk to yourself. That's what intra communication is. So when Greg Norman is thinking about how he mar market himself here, what he might tweet here, what he might put on Instagram there, but he's not really talking to anybody but himself, that's intra-communication. Inter-organization is maybe when Greg Norman is sitting around and he's thinking about a great idea, and then he decides to call his PR person or his communication director for his company, that's inter-organization once he starts doing that. And so it's important for you to understand those uh, terms. The strategic sport communication model basically just shows you how the communication process works. Um, it provides kind of a broad overview of the particular discipline of communication, and it's kind of broken up into three parts. Um, it also encompasses a broad picture and a micro, so macro and micro perspective. So, uh, Communication is foundational to sports pervasiveness and economic impact on society. So um, it's really, really important. And it's a growing industry um, that we've already talked about in chapter one. They talked a lot about how it's a growing industry in terms of television rights. The NBA is huge, the NFL and, and other leagues. Um, sports is also embracing more of a diversity of activities, although it's still slow to do so. Um, sports has not been super cutting edge um, on diversity issues, but it's working on it. Um, and so it's better than it was. It's not where it needs to be. Um, so um, that's one aspect that sports needs to do better about. So how do we define it? We define it by, let's see, I'm trying to get these pictures off the words. I guess we'll just miss some of them. But sports communication is a process by which people uh, in, you know, in a, in a sport or sports setting or through a sports endeavor, share symbols that they create meaning to interaction. So basically, just like Let's say in a normal communication process, person A wants to communicate with person B. The first thing that person A needs to do is figure out what the message is and come up with the symbols to send to person B. And so the, the symbols in most cases are the words, the alphabet that we've chosen to develop through years. And so in sports, there are certain symbols that we use that create meaning to the interaction. So sport communication is a person coming up with shared symbols to a receiver that they um, create the message for. And so it's a process um, that occurs just like any other community process, but in a sport setting. setting. Um, the institutions involved, there's a ton of organizations that own, finance, and operate sport teams. Um, organizations that cover sport teams. Um, we have within the system production systems. Um, 
places like ABC, ESPN, CBS, that generate a sports message. Um, there might be production systems within a company, um, that kind of thing. Um, if you own the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, you have your own sports mechanism that produces messages. Um, one of the things that the Buccaneers did right after the Super Bowl that was quite clever was um, Brady had kind of a bad game somewhere in the middle of the season and he lost track of downs and he went like this and he was really confused and people seized upon that as see Brady's done he's an old man he's done and then you know they they gathered momentum played better and won the Super Bowl and so afterwards Tampa Bay uh, I can't remember the exact message, but something like, how many rings are we going after? And they had Brady doing this. And so to take something that was a negative image and turn it on its head, make it positive, is a really good, smart form of branding. Um, the conditions or the environment within sports communication is just like any other communication. It's got a lot of different factors. Um, person A trying to communicate to person B, even if it's more organization A to fans, that there's an environment through which that you communicate that can cause communication not to go well. So there's an environment, um, there are things that can be noise and things like that that literally keep you from communicating. But there's meanings and audiences, content and context. And so all of that is what sports communication is attempting to do. There's a process by which we create symbols through a shared meaning, something like an alphabet and words and definitions so that there's an interaction, but there's a special context uh, in sports. So here's a, a visualization of all those words and everything I just said. So sports communication is a process by which people, you know, um, sports reporters, sports franchises, fans um, in sport, in a sports setting or through a sport endeavor, share symbols, language, visuals, as they create meaning through interaction. And so that's basically the process in a nutshell. So it's, it's what communication is, but in a sports context. It's, and keep in mind, it's a, it's a process. It's an ongoing, dynamic thing, sports communication. Okay, we got half an hour. We normally quit around noon because I come out and clean your seats, but the class really goes to 12.15, so I'm going to take every last minute here because I'm trying to catch us up. So stick with me. Um, this particular model is built on different theories of communication and um, different sports media and information that have been processed through discipline. Um, there's a lot of different theories about how impactful media can be. Um, and so there's one theory, for example, your book talks about, which was in the early 20th century, um, when radio and then uh, television becomes popular, people are really afraid of how powerful media might be, that it might be like taking a hypodermic needle, injecting it in somebody, and you completely control their mind. Now, researchers have discredited that. That's ridiculous. People's minds are more powerful than to be controlled. But there are different, different theories about the impact of media. Um, uh, Sports communication is based on genre, context, and process. And I've got three slides about each one. So genres are addressed by a variety of different theories about shapes and sizes of communication. Um, what, what is the influence of sports communication and its model? Um, structurally, it has to do with language and social systems. What's our shared language? It doesn't necessarily mean language like we're talking about, but there's, there can be a, a symbolism that's kind of a language too. Um, how's it function? What is the organizational systems that make it function? Who are the fans? Who are the people who are receiving a lot of the messages? 
Um, and then how do the fans interact with the social uh, messages of the athletes and the teams and the leagues and that kind of thing. Um, and so there's a lot of different processes that affect um, the, process, uh, the communications. Um, and then how is everything interpreted? Um, and so one of the things I enjoy a great deal is a lot of the different sports programs like First Take, First Things First, Undisputed, some of those shows, so, sometimes they're silly because they yell and argue about things, but um, there, there is a different way to interpret sports. And then there are different critical specific issues in sports sometimes. Um, is sports um, integrated enough uh, in terms of race and gender and other aspects um, and that kind of thing? So there are a lot of different specific issues. What are some social statements that can be made? That kind of thing. I always, in recent memory, I always think about Colin Kaepernick. And no matter what you think about um, how he handled his protest, he was a guy who was an amazing athlete who lost his job for protesting. Um, and you may not have agreed with him, you may have agreed with him. But I, I think it's, I think, without trying to be too political, it's a shame that an athlete just lost his job over um, making a protest. But so there's a lot of social issues. And, um, and I'm not trying to get political on you. I just, a part of me thinks athletics ought to be athletics, uh, but there is this strong social component. So there are different contexts and levels of communication. We talked about the interpersonal and intrapersonal. Interpersonal is if uh, I was sitting down and talking to Kennedy or Dalton or Brianna, and that would be interpersonal, just a couple of us talking. Intrapersonal, again, is when you talk to yourself. And whether or not you're aware, because you don't talk out loud, you do talk to yourself all the time. Your conscience is processing information or you're trying to make a decision. Um, level two is considered mediate us, mediated sports communication. That's when messages are sent through various mediums and that kind of thing. And then level three is sport communication services and support. So there's different levels of sport context. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Any questions before I launch into anything else? Anything in the chat room? Nope. Okay, I just need to pause for a minute because I just needed to. Okay, so it's really important to understand that sports communication isn't just a single point in time, but it is an ongoing dynamic process, something that continues. Um, and so it's something that is constantly going on. Um, there are various different um, transmission models of how we com uh, communicate information. Uh, linear is where there's just a sender, a message, and a channel, and a receiver. The one thing I said before. So that's the most basic sender message over a channel to a receiver. Um, those are some of the early models you probably learned in SpeechCom or something like that. And even that very basic form uh, can be fraught with problems if there's a lot of noise in the environment. Um, but uh, often what we're dealing with is something much more complex than that, um, that understands that there's a process of feedback from the receiver to the sender who then may have feedback. There may be an ongoing loop of feedback. There also are things that might block you receiving a message. I've talked about noise and there's three different kinds of noise. Um, there's selective perception, which is you perceive what you want to. Selective retention, which is you only remember what you want to. Or selective um, viewing, people only watch that which they already agree with. And those kind of things can um, block different um, communication messages. Um, I'll give you an example, selective retention. Let's say one of you came up to me and said, you know, 
I'm not taking a final. I, I don't, I'm not taking the test. And I, my response would be, you know, you're an adult. You don't have to take the final. You don't, nobody in this class has to take the final. But if you don't take the final, you will get a zero and it will negatively impact your grade. And you leave the conversation and you go back and you tell your roommate or a friend, Dr. Perry says, I don't have to take the final. But you leave out that there are repercussions for it. That's selective retention. We only retain <laughs> that which we want to. And we're all kind of guilty of that sometimes. Um, and so sometimes there's a blockage um, and understanding of that kind of thing. Uh, SRAM's model uh, talks a little bit about this. I'm going to refer you in the text to uh, figure 4.2 that kind of shows you a little bit of that. But just keep in mind that the uh, communi sport communication is a process and it's ongoing and it involves a complex environment. So producing and delivering messages to an audience sometimes works and sometimes, you know, the messages fall flat or they don't, uh, they don't come out the way we intend them. There's a lot of different things that can receive, uh, influence the receiver. So if I'm a fan and I receive a, a message, um, my ability to accept or reject your message um, can be affected by a variety of different things. Um, there's also kind of this interdiscipline, uh, interdependency between the fan and the sports organization or the sports writer that I give you feedback, you gave me feedback. And so there's this dependency upon the relationship that if it's dynamic and fluid, that we give each other feedback. Um, and that can vary from a different sources. You know, if you, if you read a particular columnist, and you like something they say, you can usually send them an email or you can post about it. If you don't like it, you can also write something um, as well. And so there's a lot of different variables. Um, the communicator's personality, um, their status, their expertise, their trustworthiness, their prestige. Um, there's a variety of different things. If a sports personality has gained a lot of prestige, sometimes that means they've also gained a trustworthiness that if they tell you something, you kind of believe it. For instance, I watch a lot of those shows I named, but the person that I trust the most in sports is Bob Costas, because he is a very objective, smart sports reporter slash commentator. And if Bob Costas says something, I tend to believe it because he has earned that reputation of having expertise. And so that's very different from somebody else. I won't name them, but there are some sports commentators that are so bombastic that I don't trust them as well because they're overly emotional. Not that sports can't be emotional. Um, in addition to the whole process about how to communicate, there are gatekeepers that decide what we get to hear and what we don't get to hear. Um, and most of those are in the sports journalism arena. Um, an editor might decide a story isn't um, a really good story, and so they block it or they downplay it. And so often editors can play gatekeepers. I don't know how obsessed you guys were with the Super Bowl the way I was, um, but there was an article that came out after the Super Bowl that really criticized the CBS sports broadcasters. Uh, who were um, doing commentary that night. I don't know how many of you know this, um, but on Thursday night, uh, Coach Andy Reid of the Chiefs, his son was involved in an accident. And his son was a lower level coach on the team. And uh, in this accident, a young kid was hurt. And the young kid, um, I think the kid is still alive, but there was, it was touch and go. And so um, that's not why they lost the Super Bowl. I'm not saying that. But the commentators don't mention it till the end of the game. And so a lot of people said that the commentators should have mentioned it earlier. I don't know if they should have or not. But that's a form of gatekeeping um, in which uh, basically, um, 
I'm sorry, someone just rang my doorbell, so it's, it's drawing my attention away. Um, but I'm gonna finish this thought. That's, um, actually, do you guys mind holding one minute? And I will be right back. I hate to do that to you, but it's my brother. I know he lives across the street and I just wanna tell him what I'm doing. So give me 60 seconds, I'll be right back, okay? I'll be right back. I am so sorry about that. Uh, my brother lives across the street and he wanted to borrow a snow shovel. And I knew he wouldn't quit ringing the bell if I didn't come to the door. So, um, so where were we? Uh, we were talking about, okay, trustworthiness and the gatekeepers. So, um, again, I'm not saying that's why the Chiefs lost the game. The Tampa Bay Bucks played better but a lot of people criticized that the commentators didn't mention it all. Uh, and that's a form of gatekeeping. Um, also within intercollegiate athletics, um, there's different gatekeepers because you're talking about, you know, unprof uh, not unprofessional, but athletes prior to professional sports. And so sometimes there's a, I don't say a protection of, but there's just a different layer of gatekeeping that uh, can be involved in college sports. So I think you get the idea that it's a process that if you draw it up on a chart is simple, but there's just so many contributing things to the environment that can influence whether or not your message gets out. The senders and the receivers, that's also a basic concept. It can range from just a few people, small groups, and it can range from multimedia, millions and millions of uh, people on television. And so the groups really change. Uh, it can be CBS News broadcasting the Super Bowl. It can be uh, Serena Williams uh, tweeting out her brand to the people who follow her. So it just ranges from small groups to big groups to millions and millions of, of people. Um, and it involves sports media professionals and social media participants. Um, the best kind of communication is a two-way communication because that way you're getting some kind of feedback and you have some idea that the receiver is actually getting your message. Um, so ideally, especially in public relations, we like to hear from the people receiving our messages because then we know they they got them and we know whether or not they understood them as we intended one of the things that's hard about the communication process is when you select the symbols for the audience you want them to get your message and sometimes there's a failure to do so um, and so it, it just kind of depends uh, so some of the senders are people like book authors, magazine editors like Hist Henry Luce, uh, sideline reporters, um, and people like that, social media managers, and the receivers are the readers, the viewers, and the followers, podcast listeners. I like listening to sports podcasts sometimes, uh, cor corporate sponsorships. So that's all part of the 
milieu, if you will, of sports communications. Any questions about any of that? Okay, we're getting near the end here. So again, sports communication is just regular communication, but within a sports context um, that you have to have some kind of understanding of the sport, some kind of understanding of the leagues and the personalities and that kind of thing. Um, you have to learn like any other beat. If you're a religion reporter, you need to have some understanding of religion. If you are a medical reporter, you need to have some understanding of medicine, science, that kind of thing. And so there's a sport setting um, where you can do it in a sport, in a setting, or through a, through a sport. And so um, there's just a special context involved. So where does sport communication occur? It occurs everywhere, in a sense. Uh, it occurs within a sport itself. Um, whether or not the, you know, Andy Reid or Bill Belichick is drawing up a new play, uh, the X's and the O's of coaching. Um, and so it occurs within the sport itself. Um, when, and forgive me for bringing up football so much, the sport just, you know, Super Bowl just happened. But when Tom Brady goes up to the line, he has a play. And if he sees what the defense is, he will sometimes change the play because he wants to um, offset what he sees the defense doing. And that's a form of communication. Um, if you watch the NBA, you know, the players communicate. So communication occurs within the game between the players, between the coaches, and that kind of thing, sometimes between the trainers. Sport communication is communication in its, of itself, and these are the different offshoots of it. So it also happens in a sports setting. Um, a team president talks with other executives about trade possibilities. This morning when I was watching uh, some of my favorite sports programs, it's very likely that the Philadelphia Eagles are going to trade Carson Wentz. Um, so there's been a lot of talk within organizations. Um, ben Roethlisberger, who's the quarterback for the Steelers, um, was supposed to meet with the team president this week to see if they're going to move away from him. He's aging. He's not the quarterback he once was. So communication occurs within a sports setting, the team president and the players or the coaches or things like that. Through the sports is, um, you know, when maybe a sports figure tweets out something uh, about a non-sport product that the athlete is paid to endorse. Um, some of my favorite uh, commercials are the State Farm commercials with uh, Jake from State Farm and Aaron Rodgers and sometimes Patrick Mahomes. Those are kind of clever commercials. That would be an example of this where they're promoting State Farm insurance through these two athletes. Um, so these are three areas that sport communication occurs. Transmission of shared symbols, that sounds weird, but that's really just a selection of the messages. I'll give you an example because you select your messages based upon the perceived audience. So a few years ago, actually quite a few years ago, I was visiting my sister and at the time her daughter was like three years old, something like that, very smart kid. But my sister, her husband and daughter, we went out to a Mexican restaurant to eat and I ordered a Diet Coke. And um, my drink came with two straws in it. And Katie said, you know, Aunt Pam, why do you have two straws? I only have one. And I said, well, Katie, that's to differentiate between Coke and Diet Coke. And my brother-in-law laughed at me. He said, did you just use the word differentiate with a three-year-old? I said, yeah, I did. So the point is that for a three-year-old, I probably should have said something like, you know, so you can tell them apart. And so part of the shared symbol is you're trying to select the right language for the audience so that they understand. And so the transmission of these symbols occurs in posts and tweets and texts and slogans. And you try to pick them for your particular audience. Um, and there's an interactivity to it. 
Um, and there's a story to it. Um, examples, uh, the story of Vince Lombardi. He is the legendary coach of the uh, Green Bay Packers. And so the Lombardi Trophy or Super Bowl Trophy is named after him. And so stories are created about these great athletes. There's rituals involved in sports um, and very specialized language. Um, matter of fact, some of you may be a little turned off about me talking about the NFL so much, so I'll kind of stop doing that moving forward a little bit. But there's a specialized language maybe involved in the sport you're interested in. Many of you are interested in baseball, and it has its own wonderful stories about things. Um, and so um, there are other symbols in sports that don't have to do with words. They have to do with things like the Nike swoosh. We, all, we see that. We all know what that means. That means just do it. It's a source of kind of inspiration and that kind of thing. There's a great deal of meaning that can be created through interactivity. Um, there's a system of verbalization and uh, gestures that can be, um, that can occur uh, that are used to create meaning and things like that. And so uh, a lot of what you're trying to do with sports communication is simply to create meaning for the other party. And so that's why you try to pick shared experiences. And again, with my niece, she probably never heard the word differentiate before. She was only about three, but she did understand what I meant, but she was kind of unusually smart kid. So there are different theories about um, sport communication, the powerful effects it has. Um, the powerful effects talk about how the media has sort of an unlimited power over the audience. And there's a lot of truth that the media is powerful, but it's not as powerful as some people have said, because if I get tired of what they're saying, I just click the button. I just turn them off. Um, we can be overwhelmed by the things that we hear, um, the hypodermic needle theory, uh, but that's, that's been very discounted that there isn't anybody out there that watches a sports program and then suddenly is indoctrinated from it. Now, can sports consume and overtake your life? Probably. Um, I remember back in the 90s when, and I am going to get off the NFL, but when Joe Montana um, was traded from the 49ers to the Chiefs and we made a playoff run, we got to the AFC playoff game, and we should have won it, but our kicker missed four field goals. Um, the very last drive of the game, Joe Montana gets us down. We're within 30 yards, and, and the kicker misses a field goal. And he missed four, any one of which, if he'd made, we would have gone to the Super Bowl. Um, and I bring that up because <laughs> Lynn Elliott kept Joe Montana from going to a Super Bowl that we probably would have won. And the Chiefs fan became so obsessed with him and his failure and his blocking us, which was the last year that Joe Montana played in the NFL, that Lynn Elliott received death threats. Death threats. They made up t-shirts about, you know, Lynn Elliott and all this stuff. And he had to move his family out of Kansas City. I would suggest to you that's crazy that people had allowed the prospect of going to the Super Bowl to not all people, but some people to an extraordinary length where Lynn Elliott no longer felt safe to live in Kansas City. And he wasn't with the team the next year. That is being overwhelmed by the power of sports. Um, and there've been other instances of it. I can't remember all the details, but there was an instance in a baseball game or a fan reached out and caught a ball that they thought was catchable by the outfielder. And then he received death threats for interfering in an important baseball game. And so I would say that when those things happen, audiences are overwhelmed by the power and persuasion of the sport. But that doesn't happen very often. And thank goodness, because that's really turning sports on its head. There are other theories about sports communication that have to do with uses and gratifications uh, about powerful effects and that kind of thing. Um, and so um, it has to do with how we are gratified by using sports and that kind of thing. I'm actually
actually going to stop here because we're right about at 1215. And I think we can pick up here and then talk about five and maybe get to six next time. Thank you for hanging in there with me. We're close to finishing this chapter, but we're not all the way there. So I'm going to stop here. And thank you for letting me um, you know, go answer my door. Uh, anybody have any questions before we sign off? Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording and I'm gonna end the meeting and we will Zoom at this exact same address on Thursday at 11. Thanks everybody.